First of all, I think some mad props need to go to Nick here. <laughs> Sending me the link to the disruptor initially. <laughs> it's the first person I heard it from. So, so uh, last week I gave a talk at the Scala, you know, Philly Scala enthusiast group about the LMAX disruptor. And the point of this talk is to talk about how there's this Java library that was created in open source by these people called uh, LMAX. Um, and I ported it to Scala, and I want to talk a little bit about the things I learned while doing that. Um, now, what is the LMAX disruptor? It's a concurrency pattern where they're claiming to handle roughly six million transactions per second. In some cases, I've heard where they're actually handling 30 million, I mean, 30 million transactions per second, but mind you, this isn't taking into account the amount of time it takes to write stuff to disk. Uh, this is purely taking uh, transactions and handling them through a single threaded uh, model. They're not using hardcore parallelism. Uh, they're avoiding concurrency. They're writing code to take advantage of what hardware gives them and execute sequentially. Um, now, the reason this is you know, pretty cool to me is that uh, as a developer, I, I think that our runtime and our you know, environments are becoming more and more virtual. Um, you know, as, as we're de you know, deploying to the cloud, as we're using virtual machines, we're thinking less and less about the impact of how we're writing code uh, impacts the performance of that code on that runtime. And what these guys have said is they think it's wrong. They think that you can write code that will handle more transactions sequentially if you write it in a way that takes advantage of that hardware and what that hardware is giving you. Uh, as opposed to doing this in parallel. So this is flying in the face of all these popular concurrency abstractions and concurrency uh, architectures that we talk about a lot today. And what's interesting also is that it's decidedly not functional programming. They are not using any kind of referential transparency. They are not using immutability. They are reusing memory and, and uh, overwriting stuff. And the reason that works is it's sequential. Now, how did they arrive at the disruptor? Uh, there was a company called Betfair, and they're handling a tremendous amount of transactions in the UK, handling you know bets on horse races or sporting events or heck, you know whatever you can think of. Um, but they didn't have a very good architecture. It was a legacy system that they built, you know, to connect to all these different data stores. They had the largest Oracle data store in the world as far as like number of transactions per second. Um, but they were only seeing about 5,000 transactions per second throughput. And they said, we got to increase that. So they started a couple of uh, projects. One was called Flywheel, another one was called 100X. 100X meant we need to increase our performance by 100 times. And they looked at various architectures to see if they would support what they're trying to do. And they looked at J2E and said, no. <laughs> they looked at uh, SATA, which is stage event-driven architectures. And I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's uh, where you're taking a, a very uh, pipelined approach to how you're dealing with your uh, events coming into a system. Um, and everything is in the various stages of the system is handled with queues at each level. Uh, and there's back pressure and load management. That's what makes it an, a SATA architecture. So actors are actually a subset of SATA that are lock free, right? They have queues. Uh, they're, they're trying to manage the, the locks that you can have in a SATA architecture. Um, they looked at you know, that as well and said, we're not seeing the throughput we need. They, they built, you know, uh, prototypes of this and said, this isn't working. Um, so the question was, why? You know, why wasn't this working? Now, they never really got to figure that out at Betfair. Um, at Betfair, they, those projects never worked due to legacy constraints. Um, but Betfair begat Tradefair, which became LMAX. And it's still a child company to the Betfair organization. Um, this is a retail trading platform, and they're handling again, huge amounts of transactions per second. Um, but they got to implement with a clean slate. They didn't have to worry about this legacy integration that was hurting them in, the, in, in Betfair. And uh, <clears throat> what's interesting about this is you're talking about a, a, an organization involved in the financial community who's open sourcing their secret sauce. I mean, yeah, they're, they're not giving everything away, but they're taking the root of where they're seeing their performance gains and giving it to the world and saying, hey, look, this is what we're doing. And, how we're doing it. You don't see a lot of financial companies doing that, I don't think. Maybe Jane Street with their OCaml libraries. Um, 
So, the concepts that they're following, they've given a term of mechanical sympathy to. Um, Martin Thompson is the CTO of LMAX, and he got this term from Jackie Stewart, who was an F1 driver back in the 70s and 80s, who uh, believed that you couldn't be the best driver unless you really understood how your hard work worked. If you really understood everything about your car, you could get the most out of it. Um, and on his blog, the first thing he posted was this quote, where a guy who creates hardware says all these software developers spend all their time wasting what we come up with for them. You know, it's a pretty valid point if you look at a lot of us developers today. I mean, who thinks about the impact of selecting a set versus a list? You know, why do we select those? Um, a lot of people don't even know that. So before I get started, I want to explain some of the architectural uh, uh, nuances that they're taking advantage of. And first off, I'm going to get into uh, caching. Now, I'm sure we've all been aware of for some time of the various levels of caching out there, like L1, L2, L3. Main memory is in and of itself a cache. And I'm sure you've heard of registers. You may not have heard of store buffers. But if you think about this, these are the varying levels of caches that represent how data is used by a core and the locality of it. Um, registers are as close to the core as possible for instant access. Store buffers are just beyond that. Store buffers help you disambiguate memory access from the order of execution of your instructions. <laughs> so processors are much faster than, uh, you know, uh, memory, memory access right now. And in order to optimize their performance, we have all these caches which are allowing us to stage data away from our cores um, in, in you know, varying levels so that we take less of a performance hit as we get data from them. So we all know registers and we probably all heard of L1, L2, and L3. Uh, store buffers are interesting because this is where we're disambiguating memory access from instruction order. And you know how whenever you, uh, you're compiling, you, you're reordering instructions unless you're putting in memory barriers and saying this is the place where I want to ensure that something is going to happen at a particular time. Uh, store buffers are allowing you to say, well, I know that I'm going to need something real soon, but I'm going to put it off to the side just for, you know, temporarily out of registers, and uh, that way I can get to it real quickly. Now, your application will typically have about four store buffers available to it at runtime. And what that means is that if you're iterating over a collection of, say, six items, it's going to have four of them put into store buffers, and then it's going to have to evict two of them to put the other two in and handle that. So you're paying a performance cost of this store buffer access uh, as opposed to if you were to write a loop and handle three of the elements and then write a second loop right after it to handle the next three elements. Is it four per core? No, it's not four per core. It's four per what you have access to in your application, right? So I'm not sure what the total number of store buffers are, and it probably varies from architecture to architecture uh, and, you know, what version of a processor you get. Um, but in the case of your application, you're only going to see typically four. Um, so if you were to handle it in three in one loop and three in a second loop, you would actually see performance that is twice as fast. And this has been benchmarked by, you know, Martin Thompson and his team. It's on their blog. You can check it out. It's really interesting to see that. You know, twice as fast, but the code looks weird. So if you do write code like that, make sure that you're putting in some comments so that somebody comes in and says, what is this? <laughs> That's the sort of thing that they're taking advantage of. If you're going out from a core here and you're trying to get data from registers, obviously you're going to see your data within single nanosecond access. If you're going out to store buffers, you're probably talking about, you know, in the teens of nanoseconds. Once you start going to L1, you're getting out there in the 20s, 30s nanoseconds. L2, 50 some. L3, you're getting up around 100. Once you're going to main memory, now you're starting to talk about microseconds. And while that performance hit sounds minuscule, Think about it on a relative basis. Think about it from the perspective of how quickly would it be if I knew that I could get to my data in L1 versus going all the way out to main memory. You're talking about, you know, literally uh, one-tenth the speed, one-twentieth the speed. Uh, that's a pretty big performance gain by organizing your code so that you know that it's going to be more local to your core, you know, and getting faster access. Now, I did want to point out that, uh, does everybody know the difference between static random access memory and dynamic random access memory? It's pretty interesting and a little bit off topic, but at least from a static RAM perspective, you're talking about data that's organized with, uh, I think, um, six capacitors and transistors uh, to represent a single data element. 
Um, whereas with main memory, you get one. Well, one transistor and one capacitor per. So you have the ability to create much more dense data in your main memory. And uh, interestingly, that data can leak. It has to be refreshed. So there's more data that can be stored up here. Literally billions of transistors and capacitors per you know, RAM chip. Um, but you know, it has to be refreshed. Um, you don't want that at this level. You want your data to be as static as possible. Uh, interestingly, the way data is organized in your caches here depends on you know, what processor you're buying, what, what, what maker is creating your chip. They have varying philosophies. Athlon processors are exclusive and can hold more data, right? Uh, which is great when uh, your L1 is comparable in size to L2, but it diminishes when the L2 cache is many times larger. So that's uh, something to keep in mind if you're, if you're trying to take advantage of your processor based upon which one you purchase, Intel and Athlon, or AMD. Um, cache misses. Now there are varying kinds of cache misses. Uh, compulsory and cold is when you've never looked at a data element before. So if you, you know, are reading a variable for the first time, uh, it's going to be pulled into cache, that's compulsory miss. It's not going to find it because it's never been read before. Capacity is whenever you have to replace something in, in the cache. Uh, so you didn't have space for it because you know, your, your, your caches are always full. Whenever you start up a machine, it, it's already got full caches when your application starts to run because it's been doing things outside of your application, right? Uh, something always has to be evicted. And capacity is a reflection of the limitations of sizes of cache. You're going to have to look up stuff that may have been there before and was evicted. Now, conflict has two types, and that's mapping and replacement. In caches, you have a certain amount of associativity with the data. Some data can be put anywhere in a cache. Some data has to be put in very specific places. Uh, you can have cache misses because of those mappings, and replacement has to do with eviction as well. Cache lines are how data gets into your caches. So whenever you go out to main memory and you say, all right, well, give me uh, you know, uh, a variable. It's not going to return just you know, a word or, or you know, a small section. It's going to return to you a consistently sized cache line. And it depends on the architecture, the size of it, but typically you'll see it's going to be about 64 bytes. Um, that means that you're grabbing a swath of memory. You're grabbing not just what you were looking for, but other data elements as well. And where that starts to hurt you is if you have two processors who are operating on data that share a cache line, they've got to arbitrate who is going to access and update that cache line at the same time, right? It's just like locking. It's got to figure out, okay, well, what's coherently? What's, what's going to happen in what order on this cache line? Now, if you want high performance, don't share cache lines, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Striding. When your application is running, you know, you're getting data, you're pulling it into caches, you're, you're um, taking advantage of these caches as much as you possibly can, programmatically you can, you can do certain things, and we'll get into that, but the hardware has the ability to do things for you too. And that means if you organize your data a certain way, it can prefetch data into caches because it knows that you're going through a sequential access of memory over, you know, as you iterate over a list. It's going to say, well, I can get that next thing because I know that's what's next. Boom, it's in your caches. You're paying no penalty for that read. It's already there for you. So you want to take advantage of striding as much as possible, but that means that your data structures have to be contiguous in memory. Garbage collection. I mean, we all know that there's a huge penalty for GC especially whenever you're talking about compaction of data in old gen. Um, what if you didn't have to think about that at all? What if you wrote code that very rarely created data that went to old gen and then was deleted? What if you only worried about deleting data mostly from the new gen, you know, your, your Eden, uh, or you didn't worry about data ever being deleted once it got past that? Then you could avoid the really painful aspects of GC, and you wouldn't have to tune it. 
you know, coming up with the right selection of which, uh, you know, GC flag to make sure that you're getting the right performance of your application. There's no stop the world compaction. Um, restarting every day is something that LMAX does, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's, it's a simple way to make sure that you don't get compaction. Uh, and the reason that came up there is because I reordered the slides and didn't fix that. So, um, so the keys to the disruptor's performance: control the core, you know, lock something to a core and execute, and never let go of that core. So it never has to figure out, okay, well, I got to pull this data out of cache that's local on that core, and you know, bring in this new data for a thread that's going to run and do stuff. Uh, avoid lock arbitration. Lock arbitration is going to go back to the kernel. You're releasing a core. It's got to arbitrate who gets access to what, and then it's got to, you know, give you back your, your thread to a specific core, and it may not be the same one, and then it's got to put that data in that cache. Uh, and on top of that, you know, if you release the kernel, the kernel may say, well, I've got to do this other thing first, so I'll, I'll let you back in there whenever I want. On top of that, uh, you want to minimize the usage of memory barriers. That's where you're saying that, you know, a data element is volatile. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, Pre-allocate and reuse memory, and then thread control. So avoiding locks. As I said, context switching, whenever you're allowing the kernel to figure out you know, uh, who is going to have access to a processor at a specific time, that's painful. Um, with locks, you're sitting there and saying, all right, well, stop. Who's got this data element? Who has the right to access it? You're synchronizing your code, right? Um, that comes at a tremendous cost. It's actually huge if you look at the numbers that they came up with for it. Compare and swap semantics where you're saying, all right, well, I'm gonna work with something, and then whenever I actually go to say, all right, let's replace the data element, is it what I expected? You know, that comes at a cost too, but it's much less. For LMAX, what they found was trying to use memory barriers where you're saying, okay, this is the point where I'm not going to allow the compiler to reorganize my code. Everything that happens up to this point is, you know, I don't care, but at this point I need to know exactly what is happening and where the data is. Um, use them, but use them sparingly. You don't want this all over your code. Pick out exactly which variables you need to be volatile and, you know, use, use them accordingly. What's wrong with queues? There's a couple things. First of all, you have two different types of queues. You've got linked lists, which are unbounded, they can, you know, they, they can theoretically be as, as you know, big as your memory space or even larger if you want. Um, or you have bounded arrays where you're saying that this is an array of like 100 elements, right? That's, if you have an unbounded linked list, they're not contiguous in memory. So they can't stride and you don't get that prefetching that's so important. If you have bounded arrays, um, data shares cache line. Think about it from the perspective of, you know, head and tail. That data can be on one cache line. And if you have head and tail on one cache line, you do anything, then it's going to have to update that. Oh, wait a second. What if somebody else is updating that at the same time? Now, that kind of arbitration is going to hurt your uh, performance. On top of that, think about it from the perspective of any time that you're reading from a queue, you're actually performing a write because you're pulling something out, right? It's no longer part of the queue. So it's not just appending to a queue, but reading from it is a write operation. And as a result, you get heavy GC. A lot of GC is taking place with queues. So queues are not an uh, extremely performant data structure. Um, with memory allocation, you know, cache is king, I always like that term. Uh, what LMAX found was if they just allocated at startup all this memory that they know they're going to need to use, and when we're t I'm not talking about small amounts, I mean, they have huge, you know, um, they have machines with huge amounts of RAM inside of them, and they're creating these ring buffers that have millions, billions of elements inside of it. Um, they, they allocate it, and then they just reuse these memory spaces as they work their way around the ring buffer. And as a result, they don't have to worry about GC and compaction. Um, they don't follow the tenets of functional programming. They sequence their data, and uh, you know, they take advantage of how their cache lines are organized by padding data. They literally say, I'm going to put one variable here, and I'm going to allocate data in front of it and behind it. And because I know that the odds are very good, while I may not have exact control, the odds are very good that these uh, variables that are before and these variables that are after are going to be sequential in memory. I'm going to have that in one cache line. 
and I can avoid this concept of false sharing, which is their term for when you have a cache line with two variables in it that are being accessed at the same time. So why not try something like Azul's solutions? Have you guys ever heard of Azul uh, systems? They've got their own hardware. They've got their own JVM now called Zing. Well, the problem is, while those are excellent solutions for most applications, um, look at what they're giving you. Continuously concurrent compacting collector, you know? Uh, GC. The, the LMAX disruptor is trying to avoid GC, so what is that buying you? Um, the Vega Computer Alliance is giving you optimistic thread concurrency. Great, except we're avoiding locks, you know? We don't have to worry about concurrency because we're, or, we're, we're performing our instructions sequentially. Um, so while those, these tools may be good for your application, for the disruptor specifically, they aren't. They may be good for the rest of your application that's using the disruptor, so your mileage may vary. It's certainly worth looking at Zing. Now the implementation of the ring buffer, this is the heart of the disruptor. This is a bounded array. In this case, I'm giving you an example where you only have 10 elements to it for simplicity. Uh, it's free allocated all at once. It's re-traversed. So whenever you reach, you know, one, two, three, four, five, so you go up to 10, it's gonna say, all right, start working with one again. Interestingly, the sequence number doesn't restart at one. It goes to 11, 12, 13, blah, 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 21, 22, blah, blah, blah and uses modulus to figure out which of these ring elements is important. So, you know, if you say that you've got a ring size of 10, if you mod your uh, sequence number of 11, you get one. But modulus is also an expensive operation they found, on the order of 600 times more expensive than, you know, doing a bit mask. So you take a bit mask of the size of this ring buffer minus one, and apply it to you know, the sequence number, you get the exact same result much faster. Now ring buffers have been around for a very long time. Your network card actually has two of them. So, you know, they're, again, they're not doing anything new here. They're just trying to take advantage of all of these concepts that have been out there that people are just not thinking about anymore. So this is sort of an implementation of the disruptor. It represents a producer which is, which is trying to put data into a ring buffer, and consumers, which are getting data out of and processing data from the ring buffer. Uh, producers typically are, you know, reading, you know, data coming into a system, whether it's network I/O or file system reads. Um, they're sequencing. They're going to put data in one, then two, then three, then four, and they also have to worry about protecting against overwriting of data that may still be in use. So consumers may be sitting back here and saying, you know what, uh, you put data all the way up to four. One of them may be at level three, another one may still be at two. If this wraps back around, it's gotta figure out, hey, somebody's still working with two. I can't overwrite that. So it's gotta, you've gotta have intelligence inside of your producers that uh, prevent that from happening. Um, you have a claim strategy, which can be either, you know, single threaded or multi-threaded. Single threaded is great because you only have one producer. Multi-threaded means you have multiple producers, but you have to use compare and swap on your sequence number for the availability of it. Again, that comes at that cost that we talked about earlier. There's a batching effect that uh, is one of the keys to how they get past latency. When they know that they have put data into a certain point, but they have a consumer that is currently using the next position, the second that that is released by a consumer, the producer says, okay, now I'm gonna work on it. But that consumer may have started running way ahead to catch up. The producer can run until it hits the next consumer. It doesn't have to say, okay, well, can I check the next one? Can I check the next one? It knows that the next one is like four. Say it was working in 10, it knows the next one is four. It can work through all of these until it hits something again. And uh, by the way, if you're writing producers, make sure you put circuit breakers in there in case things go wrong. Um, you don't want to have producers out there that are just allowing latency to happen inside of them. You want to make sure timeouts are there so that you, you don't end up with a producer that's holding everybody else in the system up. Consumers. This is actually one of the coolest parts about the disruptor because it gives you a way to compose dependency graphs in your consumers. 
Say data is being put into one, two, three, four, five by the producer. Now you have two consumers here sitting behind a single consumer barrier. And these two can operate with no dependency on each other. So at whatever rate they can, they're going to read one, two, three, four, five and operate on that data. Whether it's maybe they're journaling something, maybe they're performing some sort of business logic, who knows. They have no dependency on each other and until they hit the last point updated by the producer barrier, they can just run. However, consumer three back here is behind its own consumer barrier. And you're saying that this consumer barrier has a dependency on anybody using consumer barrier one. So until these two finish with the slot, consumer three cannot access them, cannot do anything with that slot. And now this is a diamond you know, graph of dependencies. You're saying, that's a terrible time for this. P1, your producer, C2, C1, and C3. You've got a diamond dependency graph, but it's organized very simply through your consumer barriers and the dependencies of consumer barrier two having access to data only when everyone using consumer barrier one is done with it. It's a lot harder to do if you try and do it with actors. You've got messages flying all over the place. Uh, in this case, you're allowing to aggregate actors in essence. Think about if you were able to do that. That would be a, a powerful concept. And again, you have that batch handling uh, capability where if a consumer is falling behind, say consumer one was able to get all the way up to four real quickly, but consumer two was working on one for a long time. If that happens, the second it's done with one and it knows that the producer is up at five, it can run through all the other elements as quickly as possible and therefore reduce the latency of the system. So you've got one data structure for all consumers You've got increased throughput because of this latency handling through the batch handling. Um, it's, it's a powerful concept, I think. Uh, the batching effect, I already talked about that, that catch-up capability. This actually performs better as load increases. If you have um, queues, you'll see that the graph for performance and latency is a J shape, whereas with the ring buffer, it's actually going down. Now, event source isn't directly related to um, ring buffers and, and what you've seen mostly here for the uh, disruptor, but I thought it was a, a good concept to sort of throw in here because what they're doing is they're saying for everything that's coming into our system, we're just going to write it out to the file system. And you don't even need you know, solid state drives for this because it's a sequential write. Solid state drives aren't going to buy you a lot for sequential access or sequential writing. Uh, the, the write speed is r roughly the same. Um, so they're, they're using event sourcing. The great thing about that is it allows them to say, okay, well, I'm gonna take a daily snapshot of my system. Or, you know, you can do it hourly, you can do it as often as you want. At that point, I know the state of my system. It's, it's a hard state, and I can replay any events I want from that snapshot forward and have, you know, the ability to recreate errors that have occurred without having to rebuild your whole system from scratch. Um, earlier I said that I was going to talk about that daily restart. Rather than have a system that's going to, um, you know, reach a certain point where a compaction is going to occur, even with all of their optimizing, um, they found that that's typically three or four days. They just shut off their machine every day. They've got two of them. They just hot swap. Boom. You know, it's all over on this machine now. And because they're using event sourcing with snapshots, it's very easy for them to transfer this back and forth and restart. And that's a very simple solution to something that would be pretty hard otherwise. Now, when do you use a disruptor? This is a very limited use case system. You have to have a very balanced flow for the data coming in that you're trying to handle. If you're, if you're writing a system and you have an uneven flow where your system is going to be sitting and waiting, do you really want to pin to a core? It might be worth letting go. I mean, you may get better performance by allowing your system to arbitrate that uh, you know, core usage. Um, but when you have balanced flow and you know it's a good idea to just pin to a processor, 
Disruptor with its ring buffer is a really good solution. Uh, incidentally, if you're ever wondering where the name Disruptor came from, um, in the new Java 7 concurrency lives, there's the new phaser type, which allows you to handle dependency graphs. This is something very similar to that. Management of dependency graphs, and they figured, hey, you got a phaser, you got to have a disruptor, right? <laughs> Star Trek jokes, anyone? Romulans. Yeah. I thought that was funny. So. <laughs> um, so it's a limited use case scenario. You don't want to use this just for everything you do, but it does have application. I mean, the usage of a ring buffer to compose dependency graphs is something that's useful regardless of whether you're trying to manage, you know, how fast and how minimal your latency is. So what I created was S Disruptor, and it's in my GitHub repository. Um, I took the library and I just did a straight port of it, and that meant I had to follow some constraints. Of you know, writing code in ways that I typically wouldn't. It's array-based instead of using a lot of the collections that are available and certainly not immutable, right? Um, order of execution matters. And instead of using uh, functional, um, functional, you know, higher order functions applied to collections, I'm doing four comprehensions, which, you know, there are some who say that that's what well, it is a syntactic sugar on top of uh, four comprehensions, right? Um, and I'm using companion objects, which are a really neat little way in Scala of creating things like factories. Uh, you've got a singleton object that's tied directly to a class. They have the exact same name, but you can you know define your your static uh, variables, static values inside of a companion object, and make them available to anybody. Uh, it's just a slightly different way to do things. So with arrays, you'll notice that I have this type bound here where I'm saying I have a generic type T that is covariant to abstract entry. It inherits from abstract entry. So anything that creates a ring buffer entry, an entry inside the ring buffer, has to be an abstract entry uh, child. But I'm also passing in this class manifest. And what's interesting about that is that Scala has a way of reifying types based upon type erasure. You can't easily create in Java an array that's generic in type. You can do it, but if you look it up like on Stack Overflow, you'll see that it's pretty difficult to do. Because of this class manifest declaration in my class, all I have to do is say new array T in the size. And that class manifest is passing into here the type, the specific type information to be used in the creation of that array. Order of execution. Earlier I was talking about how you're going to define all this uh, variables right here before what you're using in order to make sure that this is all in one cache line. If you were to move this up here, you know, the, the, the second declaration of these values, put it up in front of this volatile private var sequence, you can see totally different behavior. This is putting dead square in the middle of a cache line. Uh, four comprehensions. Actually, I, was, I think I was talking to Dave a little bit about this while I was working on it. Um, if you were writing a typical Scala, what you'd really like to do is to say, you know, for, for a collection, map over it or flat map or filter or use some sort of uh, uh, higher order function applied to the map or the collection. Um, I couldn't do that because I always needed access to the index. Um, in some cases, I might be operating on two arrays at the same time, and that index had to be available for, you know, both arrays. Um, this got particularly tricky if you went backwards because Scala doesn't easily support going backwards. And you say, you know, from counts dot length down to i, you write code like this. It's just ugly. But it turns out doing accounts.indices.reverse, indices.reverse is an O of 1 operation. So here I thought that if I was going to try and do something like this, it would actually be 2 times O of n. You know, go to the end of the list, reorder, and then walk that list. Uh, it turned out that's not true. In Scala, using views, it's an O of 1 operation. So that's actually kind of nice.
uh, links for anybody who might want to learn more about you know where I got all this information from. Um, there's a blog out there about the Axon framework and their usage of the disruptor and they're handling one million transactions per second doing it. Um, there was a presentation from QCon last year where they sort of rolled out or, or, or released the uh, disruptor and that's Martin Thompson and uh, Mike Barker talking about it. There's a Google group about the LMAX disruptor and they're active on it. They're in there every day answering questions. There are people who are reporting this to C++, including them. They're actually writing a port to C++ right now to see how much of a performance benefit there would be. They're seeing on the order of 10% greater performance. Um, but the flip side of that is, A, you've got a native implementation. B, you have to write a lot of uh, library code that you sort of get for free on the JVM, and you don't get that reordering necessarily that you do through Hotspot. Uh, I think that's why they went with Java in the first place. Martin Fowler had his, uh, his, his post on his blog. Um, Martin Thompson, the CTO of LMAX, has his own blog called Mechanical Sympathy. Really worth checking out. He's already written like six posts on it. It's excellent information. And uh, one of the people who works for him, Trisha Gee, she writes her own, where she takes what Martin says and tries to turn it into English. It's <laughs> something that uh, someone a little less experienced than Martin would still be able to understand. Um, Somebody created a DSL for how to compose your uh, your consumers, and uh, this was an interesting blog post called "The Demise of the Low Level Programmer," which uh, is where I got a lot of the information about caching. Highly recommend that blog post; it's got a lot of links on it. And Martin and his team will be presenting at Java One this year, so if you want, you can attend their session and get even more information about it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Thank you.